The next talk we've got being presented is from our gold sponsor, or one of our gold sponsors, Figured. Um, they've come over from across the ditch from New Zealand, uh, Richard Wyke and Alex Lundberg. So my name's Richard Wyke, um, and I'm the CTO at Figured, um, and we are um, very honoured to be one of the sponsors for today. Oh yeah, I'm Alex, uh, Head of Development. Um, I've been working I guess, with Richard for three and a half years now, and yeah, we're super stoked to be over here. We support the um, Laravel meetup over in Auckland, um, so it's really cool to come and speak at this first Laracon. Mm. Um, now, I want to give you guys a bit of background about who we are. You're probably very confused to see a lot of cows and sheep out in the foyer. Um, and <laughs> so, Figured um, is a financial management tool for for farmers. Um, and so, you know, we connect the farmer, their accountant, the banker, you know, their financial team um, to really help them run their businesses. We think only about 10 to 20% of farmers have an active budget, right? Um, and these are big organizations, you know, farms can have millions of dollars of debt, but be running without a financial plan. So it's a really big uh, liability for, for them, for the bank, um, but also for the industry. Um, and so, you know, we, um, we'd like to see that financial literacy increase. So that's, that's, where, that's what Figured does. Um, we also, um, uh, you know, really strongly believe that farmers should be focusing on profitability, not just production. A lot of uh, farming tools that are out there today are focused on how to make farmers grow more stuff. Um, but that doesn't always mean it's the most profitable decision for them. Um, often, um, you know, producing at a high, high expense cost um, can actually come at a lower profit for them. Um, so, you know, we want to help them give the, have the data to do that. Um, and so the, the talk today um, is really about how we grew our business, um, you know, helping farmers with this, with this challenge of profit versus uh, production, and how we did that on Laravel. Um, you know, starting from a very small company uh, to, you know, what we are today. I included the slide mainly for interest. I am not um, native to New Zealand, but I was not aware of the amount of, of how much the economy of New Zealand was kind of based on the produce of the farm. So I just kind of included this to just show pretty much everything on there, apart from maybe that bit of crude petroleum and a tiny little bit around SaaS software, um, is all uh, farm products. Um, and so to uh, be able to help people in that industry to make better decisions and to run at a, a better profitability rate just is... Um, an amazing challenge for us, and it's really exciting. Um, and so I'll take you through some of the stages um, that we uh, had in, um, in, in Figured um, and what we did with Laravel at the time, and the things we did to help us, uh, help us with that challenge. So I, I joined Figured October 2014, um, so you know, just over four years ago. Um, and we already had an existing prototype in market that was you know, being tested. It was written in Ruby on Rails. Um, it had been passed around a few agencies by the time, um, you know, by the time I turned up. Um, and we'd really stagnated in the market because we were finding it really hard to iterate. Um, we'd got to about 300 customers. We were just in New Zealand, um, but you know, we were struggling to gain that traction. So um, we had a bit of a reset of our company. Um, you know, we took the learnings we had from that prototype, the things we'd learned from the market, and you know, did a big reset. So we changed our sales strategy, we changed how we hired, we changed how we did development. Um, Alex joined us about this time, um, and we also rewrote the application on Laravel. Um, uh, yeah, so it started out as a pretty um, standard Laravel setup, as you'll see on the left, that looks like almost every Laravel project out there. Um, we were trying to keep things as simple as possible, so don't overcomplicate things before you need to. Also, there's a lot of things um, already in the Laravel ecosystem that you can use that we're using, Forge and Envoy. Um, there's Laravel collective packages out there that we rely on. Um, and we were using Laravel Homestead for the development environment. Um, basically, just not reinventing the wheel, using the tools that a lot of very amazing, clever people had already built. Um, there's also, uh, we use the Mongo database, um, and there's an existing like Mongo um, eloquent package that was also super easy to use um, at that time. Um, the Laravel collective thing, uh, we use a lot for annotations, 
Um, Richard, you were going to talk. Mm. Um, so we love annotations. Um, and what I'm going to show you here is a couple of code examples um, where you know, we made these decisions to use annotations really early on. Um, and this has grown with us the whole time. Um, we think annotations are great for um, reducing that cognitive load for developers. So a developer can really quickly, from a single method, see exactly what route it is, um, you know, what permissions are there, and what middleware is specific to that route. Um, we find it is, just makes navigating the co code base, especially when it's a really big code base, so much easier. Um, We've written some of our own for our own uh, permissions. Um, we also think you know, it helps keeping the, uh, the controller nice and clean because everything uh, is in the annotations. Um, so you know, it, it was one of those decisions we made that has scaled really nicely with us. When a developer um, you know, joins us, they're really quickly able to see the behavior that uh, exists on a controller without having to piece together multiple root uh, files. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then this was an, another decision we made really early on was how we approach multi-tenancy. As Alex said, you know, one of the things we want to do is keep things really simple. Um, uh, so we used components, you know, the building blocks that are available in Laravel to do multi-tenancy. And, you know, and I'm about to show you the code that's you know, in the live application. Um, it's, you know, we probably wrote it in about a day, four years ago, and it's been relatively untouched since. Um, so this is, this is an annotation for a root on a method, um, and you can see that F parameter. That's what we use to, uh, to define the scope in, in the multi-tenancy. So F would be the uh, code for the farm. Um, and the, the active, middleware, active farm middleware is what actually works it all that out for you. So um, here's the actual middleware file we, we're running in production. Um, and you can see all it's doing is it's taking the, the F parameter from that annotation. It's looking up the farm in the database. Um, it's checking if, if the user can access that. And if it is, um, it you know, sets that active context, uh, sets that globally, and drops the F parameter, which is really important because um, otherwise we had to add $f to every single method in the application, which we did, and then on the last day found out you could just drop it. So we wasted two weeks there. Um, and then, so to, to actually apply that, once we have the scope set for the, for the farm context, um, we use you know, scopes on Eloquent to, to, to manage that. Um, and you can see here, all it's doing is adding a, the where clause to every single query. And this is the trait which we add to every model. Um, you know, again, very simple. This all comes out of the box in Laravel. Now, we don't actually have a model called cow in the application, but this is a, a sort of a simple uh, thing. For a developer, now all they need to do is if there's some data which is scoped to a farm, they add that trait, and you know, we know it's tested, um, we know it's safe. All the queries, saves are all, all scoped to that farm. So, this was something we did really early. This is something which Laro helped us do really quickly. And it meant we could focus on building product for, for customers, right? Which is really what we're you know, all about, is, is getting you know, really good ha uh, software in the hands of farmers, not reinventing the wheel where we don't need to. Um, and we have some helpers like this. So when we're doing links, um, we just wrap the root uh, helper and inject in that F parameter. And it you know, works really nicely. Um, I'm sorry, Alex is going to talk in a bit. I'm not going to <laughs> talk through the whole thing. So um, we did that rewrite. We started hiring some more people. And this is when um, you know, the, the growth really started kicking in. We went from that original 300, uh, 300 customers and a team of, of me to um, you know, 1,000 customers, and we entered Australia as well. Um, and so this next section is really about how we um, took that first version, you know, a very light Laravel app, and um, you know, started uh, growing as a company. Um, wow, there's really a lot of me talking here, isn't there? <laughs> I planned it well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, this was uh, also a really important thing for us, letting the rest of our business help us. So we, had, um, you know, we have an amazing sales and support team. Um, and you know, with a really small dev team of five, we had to build out a lot of admin interfaces. So rather than 
hard coding things in. We made things configurable in admin. Um, Nova obviously wasn't around at the time, but um, you know, I think if you are writing an app now, you should jump on that as one of the very first things you do because it meant that a CS team could jump in and help us when developers were busy on other things. Um, so yeah, obviously we were growing the team at this point, going from kind of us two, two nerds to the larger team. Um, one of the things with scaling that you need to consider, we were growing quite fast. We had a lot of things we wanted to build very quickly, but you have to be careful when you're scaling a team that you're not trying to scale things too quickly. Firstly, you can't get um, enough people up to speed if you're trying to take on multiple people at once. Um, it's also very important that you don't rush that. You take the time to make sure that you're getting the right people into the roles to help you. Um, so that's what building a great team is all about. So it's taking a lot of time to make sure that you're clear about firstly what you actually need up front. You've identified those roles that are going to help you move that business forward and then that you're spending the time to um, make sure that firstly obviously the people are technically competent and very good at what they do, but also that they're going to be a really good um, culture fit into the company. Um, if you end up kind of rushing things or ending up with someone who's not going to fit into the, the way that you work um, and isn't that good cultivated, it will actually set you back just with the amount of um, kind of work and effort you have to go around to try to smooth things over and try to get things running as a smooth team. Um, we spend a lot of time in the uh, interview stages um, and also spend a lot of time focusing on our kind of values and what we think are important things as a company. Um, there are two main ones that we uh, use. One of them is, don't be a dick. It's very simple, but it's very effective. We don't want to dress things up in uh, fancy language, so we're very um, blunt about these things, um, and that's something everyone can easily understand. We also have one that's just give a damn, so making sure that you're turning up, you're representing those customers, you're thinking about uh, not just, oh, I'm going to build the shiniest, techiest thing, and it's going to be amazing, and I'm going to be really proud of it if it's not delivering that benefit to the customers, and it's not being pushed out to production because it's sitting in a staging environment for six months, then it's it's not useful. Um, so we, yeah, we spend a great deal of time building up um, a really good team, and we've got a, a group of them here today, um, I have to say. They're all super awesome. Um, at this stage, we were also kind of moving into the next uh, version, I guess, of our code. We were moving away from that standard Laravel setup that you might have seen moving into more um, domain-specific classes, um, documenting things a bit better to making sure that we're not loading up controllers with unnecessary functions, putting loads of, um, of that business logic into the model layer, um, trying to keep that just a little bit separate. Um, also using style CI, um, so now following the coding standards, making sure that not little things as to how that syntax looks was getting in the way. So things like tools like that make it really easy to just keep on top of that as well. Uh, we also had a, a really fun migration from some MySQL data, moving it into our Mongo database. Um, this was our uh, transactions. Obviously, we're a financial-based app. We have a lot of transactional data. Previously, it was sitting in a giant MySQL table, and each transaction, for a bit of context, if you have $1,000 against your expenses account, some of that will be GST, some of that will be kind of money going in and out of the bank. We have about eight different lines, maybe, that actually track the value movements of that $1,000. There's quite a lot of complicated underlying data that go into making up that number. And we had that in eight different rows in MySQL, kind of joined together with one identifier, clearly made for the document model. Um, so we did a big uh, migration to move that over. That example is a very simplified version of one of our transactions. It's obviously date, kind of basis, net amount, tax amount, and then an example of those lines underneath. Um, so you're kind of having to make these decisions to refactor as you go and trade that off against getting new features out for customers. Um, as part of that, the nature of kind of growing quite quickly is you do have to deal with tech debt and tech debt accrual. Some of this will be uh, when you're adding a new feature, you come across something that obviously was there before and you realise that, oh, if you'd just done it slightly differently, it would have made it a million times easier to put in this new feature or there's a better way of doing it now and then you kind of um, have to deal with it. Other times you do actually deliberately take on some tech debt because you having to meet a, either a particular deadline or you want to get something out before a competitor, so you're actively knowingly taking on some tech debt. The issue there is obviously you want to note that down, track it, and make sure that you deal with it as soon as possible rather than just kind of quietly forget about it. 
Um, I guess a lot of people might be familiar with the tech debt quadrant from Martin Fowler. Um, I guess the main thing is that there was the two things on the right. Um, you're either deliberately taking on something because you want to ship it now and you know you have to deal with the consequences or um, the kind of inadvertent tech debt, oh, now this is how we should have done it if we thought about it, so let's plan in the refactoring to get it how you want to. If you're in those two things on the left, you're definitely doing something very wrong. Um, oh, thanks. Um, and so we went through this growth phase. You know, we, we got to um, probably about 3,000 customers, a little over. And um, our, our business started getting quite complex. We started out helping farmers and accountants, but really it's, it's the banks. Um, and, you know, there's a Royal Commission here in Australia at the moment looking into it. But they have a lot of, um, uh, you know, skin in the game in agriculture. So we got some early support from the ASB and the BNZ in New Zealand. Um, and they started using, um, the BNZ started using our application as the front end of their credit system. So when farmers were looking for, um, you know, new loans, they would use Figured. And it was, you know, completely um, revolutionary for the banks because traditionally they'd done loans to farmers based on big spreadsheets, um, you know, a questionnaire is, do they think this farmer is a good farmer or not? Um, and, you know, th there's not a lot of science in it. Um, and so a, and a product like Figured means we get real-time financial data, which they can start actually tracking the performance of their, um, uh, their customers. This was a really interesting phase for us as a company because, you know, things started getting um, pretty serious. We had to, you know, being part of someone's credit system meant we had to do a lot of due diligence, um, you know, audits of our code, um, you know, better testing frameworks. Um, and, you know, we really strongly believe that Laravel helped us do that because it made the, you know, as an example, the penetration testing which we had to do for the banks, it made that process so much easier um, because it was a, you know, well understood, well maintained, high quality code base that we we're building on top, uh, on top of. Um, and, you know, we, and we embraced the ecosystem there. So, you know, we didn't want to own everything and, and build everything. Um, you know, we used Forge and Envoy and AWS and Paper Trail. Um, and, you know, although those things make developers' lives easier, they actually make the business's life easier because, you know, these are all trusted brands that a bank, um, you know, has some faith in. So, um, you know, embracing the cloud was, was really important. Um, you know, and, and the, the ecosystem which we're a part of, you know, really helped us um, with InfoSec, um, which is, you know, a huge thing when you're a financial application. Um, and, you know, you couldn't write all this stuff if, if you tried. Um, it would take you forever and you wouldn't be adding value. Um, unfortunately, when we started, Stripe wasn't around in New Zealand, so one of the things we did write ourselves was our own billing system. And, and you know, we wasted three months and it's hideous and we're stuck with it now, but because um, <laughs> billing's really complicated. <laughs> Um, so, you know, things got complicated and, um, you know, I'm not sure we always knew what we were doing, but we, um, <laughs> we, we did our best. Uh, yeah, so as Richard mentioned, obviously we're kind of playing with the big boys now. Uh, we need to deal with service level agreements, uh, audits, penetration testing, all of those fun things now that you're dealing with corporate level banks. Um, we also have to think about the release windows. If you're pushing something out with a big migration, don't do that in the middle of the day. Like the bankers are going to be completely annoyed about that. Um, we're also branching out with the, the different markets. You end up with also having to factor in time zones when you're trying to think about when to deploy things like that. Um, with the deployments as well, I also included just that screenshot. We still deploy everything through Envoy, which gives that zero level downtime. But we did have an issue at one point. Uh, the way that the annotations work, they compile all of those annotation things for the roots um, and the permissions and into the shared storage folder, um, which at the time, obviously, with Envoy has the current release folder, then it creates a new release, builds up everything in there, and then switches that um, symlink over at the time of release. But obviously, if you are overwriting those compiled files in the shared folder, that suddenly, halfway through your deployment, starts looking a little bit different, even though the code hasn't changed yet. Um, so there are kind of little surprise things like that that kind of bite you along the way. Um, so we've solved that problem. Um, there's still obviously the migrations that run partway through that does bring the app down. But um, at the moment, we're still running off um, Envoy for everything, and that's working really well. At some point, 
depending on the level of data and migrations, we might actually need to look at how we do our migrations and deployment, but it works really well at the moment. Um, performance is obviously a big thing that we need to consider. If you've got um, large accounting practices, they're sitting down with their clients, they're wanting to talk through their numbers. The bankers, they're, they're, they're trying to talk through numbers and work out kind of at the time if they want to, you know, if they can give this lending or not, if this loan makes sense or not. Um, so they don't want to be hanging around for ages waiting for reports to load or anything else to happen. Um, so we use New Relic is a tool that we use for that, which is invaluable um, for tracking things down. Um, I put this uh, example up just because I always find it quite interesting. Um, the eloquent model at the top, um, obviously it's just calling a new model, it's doing a load of where's and then it's getting a load of values out. If you've got a lot of data, that's just one query into the database to get you a bit of data. The bottom one, someone's accidentally missed something, they've just kind of like, oh, doing a model, get all of the records. And then although that uh, bit at the bottom, the API kind of call looks exactly the same, it's just doing some where's, it's doing a get. If you're not paying attention closely, it looks like it could be a model and just doing an easy thing. But because by that point it's a collection, every single where is filtering through every single record in that collection to throw out the ones that it doesn't want. Oh, there's another where. We'll filter through every single record in the collection, filter out the ones we don't want, get. Um, and you've got yourself something really painful and inefficient at that point. Um, so that's just one of the interesting things that uh, can be quite confusing if you're not paying attention to just how that, what data it is that you're dealing with there. Um, the main issue with us, though, in terms of scale is not actually a kind of traffic problem. We have like 60 million HTTP hits a month or something. 50% um, of our 20,000 users are active every month. We don't have a lot of people in a traditional um, scale issue. What we do have, though, is a data scale thing going on. So this is our just our Mongo database, um, 150 gigs of data, 300 million records in the whole database. As I say, our transactions is the biggest thing that we have. So we've got 95 gigs of data, 150 million records for there. And if you remember, the transaction data itself with all of the different lines, when we want data, we want data for a particular account. If each transaction record has eight lines or something, that's about a billion like transaction lines that we want to go through to pull out to create reports that look a little bit like this. So like 12 months of data per account, um, then get a total at the end. That's a small section on a report that might be you know, 20 more sections that look exactly like that. Um, and we want to pull it out of our big Mongo collection in real time. We don't want to pre-caching pre anything. Um, so that's kind of quite a big challenge for us. Um, so it meant we also had to make some changes as we went along. So we had to not rely anymore on our eloquent Mongo package. We ended up with a really lightweight um, kind of just a, a wrapper for the Mongo driver itself, which means for a count on a collection, you end up with something just like this. It's just an array that you just kind of send in. It'll give you the count of that filtered record. Um, but the real power of Mongo and part of the limitation of the eloquent package that we were using is we wanted to really use the aggregation pipelines. If you want to hear someone get really excited about aggregation pipelines, come and talk to me later. I think they're amazing. Um, but you end up with something, this is a simplified version. It looks a little bit like this. Um, well, this is the first match stage. So basically the same thing as the initial query, just filtering down by farm and type and some accounts that you want to match and some dates. Um, but then you get on to the next few stages, so you can do an unwind on the lines, which means instead of uh, 100 transaction documents, it'll split each line out into its own document that just has that one line. Um, and then you can do other things like project the account ID and the amount and do some magic in that interval fields uh, parameter that will attach a key to tell you which month it is. Um, and then we can group it all by the interval account ID and the amount and get you the sum. Um, and that's all across those a billion transaction lines. And this is our new relic um, kind of stats for how quickly that is, um, you know, 14 milliseconds. I'm happy with that. That's good. <laughs> um, so a lot of our stuff is on the PHP side there where we have efficiencies in the report code. But. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we're big fans of Mongo and it's you know, great for our reporting. Um, in a really, really interesting, um, you know, phase, we were growing really well in Australia and New Zealand and, you know, the code was growing with us. Um, and then we got a call from a bank in America saying, you know, we've looked all around the world for an application that helps agriculture, focus on profit, not production. Um, and we found you guys um, and, you know, we really want you to come over and help us. And we were like, no, 
we, um, you know, and we've seen a lot of New Zealand and Australian companies grow too early. Um, you know, the talk before, really interesting growth at all costs. You know, we knew that that was going to be um, a step too far for us. Um, you know, our team was, um, you know, five, um, and in, you know, over this next phase, we get to about 13 by the end, but um, we didn't want to go there too early. But we took the call again when they called back, um, and our CEO at the time, who's now our chairman, um, said, I'm just going to go and go and have a chat to them. Uh, we were very nervous in the development team, right? Um, because, we, you know, we knew the size of a bank in America. You know, there's about half a million farms in, in America. This bank that called us had 60,000 farms, just not this one bank. And that's more than, you know, all of New Zealand. So, um, and then our, our CEO came back and he said he found a reason why we should go to America. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that decision was made for us. <laughs> um, oh, actually, I, I jumped a bit. I was going to prepare everyone before this slide. Um, now, so we were all of a sudden hiring loads of people, right? Um, and we were doing loads of interviews. And um, Zainab, our uh, head of talent, who's sitting at our um, booth out the front, um, you know, doing lots of interviewing. And it's really interesting how often this comes up in interviews. People going, why are you using Laravel? I mean, that's definitely the wrong thing. Like, enterprises use Symfony, right? And um, for me, it's such an interesting insight into what a developer is really like. Um, you know, we were using Laravel as the front end of the credit systems for all these big banks in America. Um, you know, we focused on customer, um, you know, value for them. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether it's... Symphony has like a more enterprisey vibe about it, but um, everyone just assumes that we were doing the wrong thing. Um, and you know, I think the when this question comes up, a I was like next, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but but b um, you know we use Laravel as a framework, right? Um, all the stuff Alex has been talking about, you know, our real um, precise use of aggregation pipelines to query a billion documents. You know, there's no package that does that. That's not in a framework. Um, you know, if there's a Symphony package, we would have used it, right? But there isn't. Um, and so, I don't think it really matters. Um, I think, take a, take an example, our prototype of, in Ruby on Rails. I don't think that was Ruby on Rails is bad, right? And Laravel is better. Um, I, I do think that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's not the reason you're going to be successful or not. The reason you're going to be successful is if you are a good, conscientious development team and you care about customers, and you want to support them. Um, so, you know, using Laravel as a framework, it's our entry point into the code we, we write. Um, you know, if you think your framework choice is going to be the biggest challenge or problem you have, you know, you're so wrong. It's going to be hiring good people. It's going to be, um, well, actually, no, it's just fine, good people. Um, if you get that, everything else gets, um, gets sorted. Um, and then, so, you know, I give that answer, and they're like, ah, but facades, right? Um, and I'm like, right, this guy's definitely not getting hired. Um, <laughs> so we use facades. Um, we, we like them. We use them for all the framework stuff. We use it for cache. We use it for auth. Um, we actually don't write our own ones. Um, as a you know, preference, uh, we um, use the use dependency injection in the container. Um, we use contracts a lot. Um, but, you know, again, um, we find facades super easy to test. Um, this isn't the reason why, as a business, you're not going to be successful, which is sometimes in the mindset of developers is that if you make this tech technology choice, you're instantly going to fail. And I, I don't think that is you know, that bright, really. Um, the other thing as well is um, we you know, are looking to reduce the overhead on developers. Um, we we want to keep things simple. So we love the monolith. Um, we, we had a lot of advice, again, early days. People saying, like, you're, you're going to be this huge company that's going to take over the world. Um, you have to use microservices from day one. And um, you know, clearly, you don't need a HTTP boundary to write good, independent code. So we use packages a lot. Um, all our code internally is arranged into packages. Um, and you know, but, I, mean, I think probably everyone in here realizes that um, you know, if you're isolating code into um, you know, its own 
or in areas that makes things a lot simpler. So we use packages and we use contracts in the same way Laravel provides them as well. Um, and it makes things, again, really simple for developers to come up to speed because they can just look at all our contracts and they can see all the methods that are available to them. Um, now, we do have some microservices for completely external things, but nothing in the main app. And part of the reason is, you know, we, we don't think fundamentally microservices are bad. It's just as a financial application, that would mean we have to suddenly worry about rollbacks and distributed transactions and, um, you know, how we handle exceptions in different parts of the app. Um, we work with a company called Xero, and you know, they're um, you know, a huge New Zealand success story. Their developers gave us some really good advice that, you know, as a financial application, keeping things in a monolith makes things an order of magnitude simpler. So you know, that, that was a choice we made early on as well. Um, and like, like I said, the, the packages, they give you um, self-documenting code, clear boundaries, um, and a bit of order to some chaos. That's pretty much just an example of one yeah. <laughs> of those. Um, actually, one thing, um, one thing we do, though, is um, we're quite careful about passing eloquent models around. Um, if something is bitten us more times than um, anything, it's where an eloquent model goes outside the package boundary, and then something else updates it in a way that that package never expected. So we're quite careful about that. But otherwise, um, you know, we use uh, packages um, as provided by Laravel, and they're, they're great. Uh, so yeah, we are also, whilst we are developing the team, we're developing the code, we're also trying to think about developing our development environment. Um, so up to this point, we've been running on Laravel Homestead. Uh, we now decided that actually we need to be, you know, thinking ahead a little bit more. Um, so we started using Docker, uh, which has worked out really well. It is so easy now to get our app up and running. Um, it also makes it more consistent with our staging sites, which also run on Docker, and we now have a really fancy thing in GitHub where you just hit a button and you've got a staging site that you can send people to go and test things on. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and at the moment, we're not uh, uh, running this. Uh, that's all actually running off Kubernetes, um, which is also awesome. We're not running that on production yet. I don't think we're at that point, but um, at some point, see, we now have also all of that groundwork that if we want to end up moving our production stuff onto Kubernetes, it will be a lot easier. Um, we also, as part of the agreement with this US bank, we had to take our giant, massive Mongo database and move it from our beautiful Sydney AWS data center over to uh, Oregon data center, uh, which was uh, not the easiest move to make. Luckily, we were using... Um, the Mongo Atlas stuff all online, so those guys, um, credit to them, they helped us out a lot trying to move that. Um, bonus also, the Oregon data center is cheaper than Sydney. Why is Sydney so expensive? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're developing both the um, uh, our development environments and also moving production along to keep up with kind of our, our pace of growth and the team. Um, Alex talked earlier about the tech debt uh, accrual, um, and it's you know, really important that the rest of the business, demanding customers, our own board, the, you know, the leadership team, understand that this is something that we have to deal with as part of a healthy dev team. Um, and it can be quite a foreign concept to, you know, a board who aren't technical to go, what do you mean you need to rewrite that code you just wrote? You know, why didn't you do it properly the first time? Um, and so we break um, our development process into months. There's a milestone at the end um, which is you know, our promise to the, the customers and the company of what we're going to deliver. But that first week is reserved for the development team to focus on tech debt tasks. So product isn't allowed to put anything into that week. It's completely up to the developers what they do. And um, you know, we've found actually that developers are pretty good at focusing on customer value, um, you know, fixing things about performance or you know, making the development environment better or you know, um, you know, improving interfaces. That, we don't mean by Tech Debt Week, you're going to switch to the newest JavaScript framework every month, right? Um, this is a customer value piece. But it's really important to, for us to set it aside at the beginning, to set the expectation to our company and our investors and our board that we are going to build this product for the long term. Um, and you know, we think a week every month is a really healthy amount of time to be focusing on just improving what you've got. Um, and so, you know, we're growing. Um, this is pretty much where we are now. Um, half of the company is in, in our teams. 
um, we're about 60 people. And we joke about getting corporate, but you know, we're not really. Um, but it does mean we have to change how we do some things. Um, mostly that's around communication, documentation. Um, but one thing that's really interesting is that we have, you know, at this stage, we actually have two boards as a company. We have, you know, the, the normal board. But then we have a se separate one, which is just for technology. And, you know, we found that so useful, having ad external advice, checking the things, we, you know, we're thinking to, um, you know, make sure that we're growing this company for the long run. Um, uh, yeah, so as Richard mentioned, communication is a big part of the, the kind of growth things. This goes back to a little bit what Donna was talking about in her talk as well. Um, I really love this tweet um, and that those images there. If you've got a few people, it's so easy to get everyone on the same page. You just get in a room, have a chat, off you go, you're up and running. As soon as you kind of start adding people to the team, even just adding like one more person to the team, you've just got the, all of those extra lines of communication. Um, so how do you make sure that everyone is on that same page so that they understand what it is that you're trying to do, that they understand where they're where you're going as a company, that they understand what their role is in taking that forward. Um, it adds a lot of complexity, like people are hard. Um, <laughs> so there's a few things that um, kind of help with that. We have some, well obviously we've got our um, kind of sales teams over in the US and now in the UK and Aussie. Um, we also have some developers based remotely, so in the US and in Argentina and um, someone in Hungary. So. We have to think about these remote people first. Um, we even fail sometimes in the office to have a, a proper kind of shared understanding and shared communication. So if you're based over in Argentina, imagine how many issues you're going to have if you're not getting this clear, consistent message coming across. It's just impossible. So I think in remote first, um, uh, we have a really excellent meeting system where you can easily just record meetings. Um, so you can share so that if people can't make it because it happens to be at 2 a.m. their time, you know, they can catch up on that and see what was discussed. So not only do they get the um, decisions made out of that, but they can kind of follow that context of the conversation. Um, deficient meetings, you don't want to be hanging around and talking for, you know, three hours when you could put in a, a strict agenda and get something decided and found out within 30 minutes. Also, you don't lose sight of why you were having that meeting, what was your outcome, what was the intended thing. Um, documenting those decisions, um, including the context of how those decisions were arrived at. So if you've got a recorded meeting, great. If you've got something written down, um, don't just write down, oh, we decided to do this, write down, you know, these were the things that we talked about, these are the pros and cons. Um, we didn't do this one because of X, so that then later in a, you know, six months, a year, you can be like, well, why weren't we doing it like that? And then you can go and refer back to it and be like, oh, yeah, let's not do that because obviously this is going to blow up because of this reason. Um, Obviously, open, shareable communication. If everyone's having private chats all over the place and deciding on things, other people can't be involved, they can't put in their opinion, they might have a really excellent point that you want to know about that no one else has thought about. Um, and the last one is uh, quite interesting, kind of reiterating that vision. Um, it's something that I've been thinking a bit about recently. Like we obviously have a lot of new people joining the team. They don't have that context of the history of why we are where we are now, how we've grown, why some of those decisions were made. Um, obviously, me and Richard have been doing this for a long time. We were generally on the same page most of the time. Um, but when, <laughs> when you come in and you join, you don't have that history. You don't know kind of that we started out maybe focusing on farmers more and then moved into accounts and then we've suddenly got banks. So you have to be able to, to share not only that context, but also be really clear about exactly where it is that you're going. Um, if you have, uh, what have we got, like six different teams working on various things that are all contributing to our product, it can be really easy to get lost in those JIRA stories and the, that fine level detail um, as well. So being able to keep an eye on those, those high level business goals and that ultimate vision of the company and keep referring back to it so that people can remember what it is that they're trying to do and what customers they're trying to help and what that means overall, kind of why they turn up to work every day, I guess, is really important and it can get a little bit lost in that every day thing that you turn up to do. Um, so yeah, writing things down, developers are never that amazing at writing things down, dare I say. I can say that. I fail to write things down quite a lot of the time. Um, but it is super important, so that's not just the business decisions, that is the um, technical decisions, um, that whole context piece as well. Um, there, there is a risk of probably writing down too much in terms of code documentation, um, so obviously try to um, do self-documenting code. Um, 
and document, like we try to pull out the high level concepts of how the code works into Confluence, but not loading it up so much that as soon as you change one little thing, it's completely out of date because nobody, well, if they write it first time, then they're not gonna maintain it. So kind of keeping that balance going. Um, and so I'll show you a couple of little examples of how we actually do documentation. This is real documentation from, um, uh, taken from my PHP storm, which unfortunately I don't get to use that much anymore. Um, so, you know, we, we document in the code, we use re, um, markdown files. We compile, so every package has its own documentation saying how to use it. We then compile that down into a single doc site. So a developer can just go to our app and, you know, browse the documentation. Um, it seems like a real big overhead when you're building stuff, but actually it's super useful when a team is building this cool new thing. And you can just go view the documentation. Um, and, it, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why Laravel as a framework is so successful, because the documentation is so excellent. We want to build that in our own um, application as well. Um, and the final thing on documentation, this has been a really valuable thing for us. So we keep ADRs, architectural decision records. And as Alex was saying, the context of a decision is often more important than what the decision was itself. So um, what we record is why we decided to do something. You know, what was the environment that this decision was taken in? Um, then we you know, document what the decision was and then the status of it. This is really useful when a developer comes along later and goes, you know, why are you doing this? You can see why they decided to do that. Often as well, actually, you can go back and go, well, this decision doesn't make sense now. You can see why it was made at the time, and those things don't apply anymore. So we can change that, and then we will update that architectural decision record to say, we forgot that one. Um, so these are really valuable, and I really um, you know, think if you're building a product for the long run, you should start doing these really early. You know, document those early decisions and why you made them. Um, and so just to wrap up, um, you know, we, we've grown a lot as a company. Um, we've... Uh, just moved to you know, new offices, um, which seem you know, huge and corporate to us, but um, you know, we're building a lot of really cool projects. Um, and you know, one, of the, one of the really interesting thing, actually, we've grown the dev team you know, hugely, but actually our CS team, um, you know, when we were doing our prototype, it was a team of five. And when we had that deal with the banks, it was a team of five. And we went to America, it was still a team of five, and today, I think it's at five. Um, and, you know, it's, um, the, the lesson there, I think, is, um, you know, you have to think about building a scalable business. Um, it's not just about code. You have to do things which are going to scale, especially in a SaaS app. If you're, you know, having to increase headcount hugely every time you go to a new market, the costs aren't going to make sense to you. So um, hiring really great people with a real customer focus is our absolute secret weapon. Um, and they're passionate about you know, what's right for the customer. Um, just a week ago, the development team were about to push, a, push a, an update and we posted in Slack saying, hey, this is about to go out. And all the CS team were like, what the fuck are you guys doing? That's not going out. <laughs> and you know, because they, they, they saw this thing that we we're gonna do and it was completely wrong for the customer. And it, we'd missed it in product, we'd missed it in dev, and they just you know, put their foot down. And that's so great because uh, you know, to have a team like that looking after customers is amazing. So hiring the right sort of people back to you know, what we were talking about before is, is critical. But you know, Laravel has scaled with us the whole way. We're still using Forge and Envoy for production. Um, you know, we might move for some flexibility reasons to Kubernetes, but it's still scaling with us, absolutely. And Laravel as a framework still is. Um, this is the day we uh, did Laravel new project. Um, and you know, this is what we're like today, you know, much bigger, but still using same, same software, same framework, and a lot of those decisions we made from the early days, you know, are still working for us. So um, when someone says to us, you know, why are using Laravel and Enterprise, you know, we go because it's great for it. Um, and that's our talk. Thank you.